Good afternoon. Uh, welcome here to the Forum 2000 conference. Uh, my name is Mike Spoda. I'm coming from a Czech NGO called People in Need. I'm in the Human Department there. And I'm very happy to be able to welcome you here on this session, which is entitled Meeting Dissidents as a Democracy Support Tool. From Funders to Stools to Patochka to Cuba, Belarus, and the Dalai Lama. And I think that that pretty much sets what the discussion is about. We have, we have a very dis distinguished panel of guests, which I would like to <laughs> introduce there from the accident place. Uh, we have Mr. Ivan, Hva Ivan Hvatik, uh, who is the head of the uh, Patochka Archive at the Czech Academy of Science an archive that he founded in uh, 1990 and he actually closely collaborated with Ivan Patočka in the 70s. He uh, organized those famous in-house seminars at the time and after his death in the 70s he hid basically his, his, his complete works and uh, that was the base uh, for the archive. In 1993, with <coughs> he created the Center for Theoretical Studies uh, as a joint uh, operation between the Philosophical Faculty of Charles University <coughs> and the Academy of Science. Uh, another person in line, I don't have to uh, introduce very much, at least to those of you uh, from the Czech Republic in the audience, it's uh, Jiřina Šiklova, soci sociologist, uh, writer and activist, uh, very active during the during the let's say, dissident years, during the 70s, 80s, signatory of Charter 77, she was jailed in the 80s, and uh, she remained active ever since. Uh, she's a lecturer, she was a candidate for the Green Party, she was the founder of the Central Library of Gender Studies that since then mushroomed into this very good and, and uh, continuing organization. Uh, here is Mr. Aleš Michalevich, a person coming from a similar background, but with a more com contemporary view. Aleš Michalevich is a, is a presidential candidate for the president of Belarus in the elections in 2010, which didn't uh, end up quite well. Yes, you know that the, the presidential election ended in a renewed, way, a renewed wave of uh, political repressions by, by President Lukashenko. He headed the Belarus Student Association, uh, youth exchanges, uh, he's a lawyer by education, he was jailed after the election as, as well as <coughs> nine other candidates, right? And uh, from this spring he, he has a political asylum in the Czech Republic. And to, to my right are very, two uh, very distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Franz Timmermans, uh, which is a veteran uh, diplomat politician from the Netherlands. He is an MP at the, at the Dutch Parliament and he was formerly the Deputy Prime Minister for European Affairs and uh, he served in various diplomatic posts of course and he was also advisor and collaborator from Max van der Stoel at the OSCE so you have the direct experience and to my far right is Mr. Vladimir Galushka who is the Deputy Foreign Minister of, uh, of the Czech Government and he also has a very long track record in diplomatic service. He, he used to be in the diplomatic service from the year 1990. He uh, had various positions at the, at the embassy in Washington, at the UN. He was ambassador in Slovakia for some time. He was a director of the Human Rights Resources Department at the Ministry, director of the Americas Department at the time, of the Bilateral Relations Department and of the Consular Department. So I think you can see that we have a very, very uh, distinguished panel that, that falls into several categories. Uh, first of all, Mr. Khvatik and, and, and Ms. Shikola who can provide more information about uh, how it actually was during the time that this panel is referring to, the, the historical meeting between Van der Stoel and Papačka here in Prague in, in, the, in the 70s. Uh, we have Aleš Michalovic who has the same perspective but from a different uh, environment and, and like very fresh, let's say, or contemporary. And we have two veteran diplomats, politicians that, that, uh, that know, uh, that happen to represent what happened, but that represent the countries that, as Netherlands, obviously, and as the Czech Republic, I believe, as well, are often at the forefront of, of uh, engagement in human rights affairs at the international stage. So that perspective is very, very interesting, I think, as well. And. Uh, I would like to ask each one of the panelists for a contribution, like maybe up to 10 minutes, and then we will open up, open it for discussion. I hope there will be a wide discussion. 
feel free to interrupt at any time. We have microphones here somewhere that will be handed to you when you have a question. And I think there is a number of questions that we can that we can focus on. First of all, you know, diplomats visiting uh, visiting dissidents. What does it mean? What does it mean for the people? Why is it important? What it actually is? It's of course a sort of political message, and but it's also uh, quite significant moral support and help. And in that regard, I, I very much like a quote by by former U.S. Charge d'Affaires in Burma in Rangoon, uh, which kind of gives the the internal perspective. And he says, living in an authoritarian country uh, while you're in the midst of it, it's hard to see that uh, they ever seek power or go away, meaning the dictators. But actually, they cause their own destruction. Their founda foundations are rotting, and it's a question of time, which is a very nice view. I think uh, another uh, question that, that it leads up to in the more contemporary sense is uh, what should be done, basically, what should be done by the diplomats of, of uh, the, the, let's say, free countries or democratic countries in, in repressive societies, in repressive embassies, <coughs> and what are the tools, and what, at what level has to be the political will, actually, to, to make this happen? Should the diplomats, uh, how are the, what are the mechanisms to be able to give those tools to the diplomats at the, at the countries? so that they know what is the range of options and what uh, should it be something directed by the MFAs or should it be left uh, more to the individualities of the, of the ambassadors. And also what are the political risks. So there are, even in the title of this panel is mentioned the, the example of Dalai Lama, which is the most illustrative example in a way. I think that it's all, always a political issue that uh, often uh, there is reluctance to meet Dalai Lama for, for fear of the Chinese reaction. And the question is really, uh, to what degree this is causing a real political damage and to what degree not. I would argue, uh, from my NGO point of view, that, and I think there even is a study to that regard, especially to Dalai Lama, and the, the consequences in bilateral relations after the meeting, I would argue that the impact is not that big, actually. That there is usually some immediate reaction, because there has to be one, but in terms of the long-term uh, real impact on the relation, there's nothing serious because uh, basically most of the authoritarian regimes are quite pragmatic. But they have to do this immediate reaction. But sometimes it even serves uh, the way that I would think those governments, the authoritative governments, want it to serve. Maybe as a tool that the, the other partners are, it's preventing them from doing it for the fear of, of an impact that might or might not be so, uh, so severe then. But I don't know, this is just my view, and I'm very interested in, in what, uh, what the panelists think. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I would like to start with the, with the only woman on the panel and ask Jirina uh, Shiklova for her contribution. Thank you for the invitation. I am so called witness. Now, what it means to be witness? My duty it was sometimes smile to these manuscripts abroad and then forgotten all that I have, what I know, yes? And it's the second, but two points, I fulfilled very well, yes? And this is the reason why I, uh, my remembering Con Wonders 2 is very problematic, uh, and I only remember uh, how it was at the beginning. I would like to repeat this, this now very well known, and then when started Charter 77, we didn't thought that it will have so big influence. I think it's a very big, uh, oh, it's a very uh, important role was given with this, that our communist media over-evaluated at this beginning this text. Yes, and they had done from this something what it is secret. I personally, I remember this text, yes, and then I said myself, yes, it is good, very well, uh, yes, a very good text, but it is not the text which is very well for the proclamation, to, to knock, yes, complicated sentences, etc., etc. Yes, it was one of the role of the journal, journalist and the Center Committee of Communist Party. 
The second report was very intense. And it happened, yes, a little embarrassed. Or uh, how did this, this first reaction from the people which were abroad was only the information. The first men who break with this diplomatic was not very well, excuse me, as a diplomat, was Van der Stuhl. He visited and he met uh, Jan Paduchka and how it was informed now that it was in this hotel intercontinental. Yes. Maybe, I don't know, but I believe that this is the truth. Yes. All of this discussion were on the uh, no, balance between the rule and uh, something which were against this rule. Yes. I think this our conference, the Forum 2000, has the name democracy and the rule of law. Rule of law, what Richard law. He was law from the point of the Communist Party. Yes, it was the rule. It was the law, isn't it? Yes. And when uh, somebody has done it, against it, it was auto or against the rule of law which were in this state and which were in this time which should be accepted. It means that it was the uh, democracy or the opinion of the people were above of the law. Now sometimes I think that we would like to speak that here should be the democracy and law and not that they should be against it. Second one, what I would like to tell you is uh, how uh, important was the role of the uh, Dick Herc Kane. Uh, he was a journalist and sometimes I have the impression that we are only gossiping journalists and think that the journalists and media make a wrong work. No, here you have the example how it was important for us and for this. And the last thing which I would like said here is that it was this impulse for the other diplomats. And after <coughs> what was done from Hunter's school, it was the it was the impulse for the other diplomats abroad that after then they accepted, for example, Charter yes, and, uh, and that um, it was accepted that something what is again the rule in this country, right, that it may be very well. Now, I think that the heritage of it, what was done from Dick, right, yeah, I have I have given his name, but pronunciation is very, very complicated for me, yes. Uh, and understood, yes. Uh, and what they have done for us, that is the heritage for us. So that is the reason why we should help to the other countries in which they had or they have, yes, mortality, the similar troubles which were here. 20, 22 years ago. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to pass the word to Mr. Khatik. You obviously were a close collaborator of Mr. Patočka during that time. So, uh, the, uh, what's that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> I think I have to review a little bit what happened, uh, what we are speaking about. <clears throat> so. Yeah, Badajka was the, one of the first three uh, spokes, spokespeople of uh, Charter 77. Uh, we uh, studied with him for the whole time since 68 and organizing his private uh, seminars and uh, lectures. And uh, when uh, and uh, what happened was that uh, one day, it was on the first of uh, March 77, he was visited by Dick Verkaik and uh, I think some other people, some other journalists were coming with him uh, in his flat. He didn't expect that. 
and uh, they offered to him to be a, to, to be uh, to be uh, accepted by um, by Max van der Stuhl here in this hotel. And uh, although Batushka was ill, there is some bronchitis or whatever, uh, he got up from the bed and uh, was ready to come here and came. And uh, he made this interview, I have some pictures from that time here. And uh, so uh, the police was uh, quite outrageous uh, on that. Uh, they visited him, I think, the same day in the afternoon at home and uh, tried to, to ask him what happened and so So he made an official uh, official information, uh, formal information for the, for the Czech government about this meeting. And uh, uh, so then the next day or the day after, uh, there was uh, a, a big party planned at, uh, at the embassy of uh, West Germany because they were opening the new residence. And uh, because police was very afraid of Patochka, when they realized that he could, he could uh, uh, promote Charter 77 also there, they uh, wanted to prevent him from visiting this, uh, this uh, party. So they took him to the interrogation to, to Rusinia, the famous, uh, famous uh, jail here in Prague. And they kept him there the whole day until the very evening so that he couldn't join this meeting. And that uh, exhausted him so terribly much that uh, I think the same night uh, he, he got uh, caught. Cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, Cerebral hemorrhage. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. And so he had to be hospitalized, and uh, then he spent about a week in, in the hospital and died on the 13th of March. So that was that was the uh, the story which uh, is in a way so important. Uh, on the very day as he died in the hospital, we got the information from uh, the Radio for Europe. And uh, so we decided to um, go to his flat and with the help of the rest of the family to pack all his uh, materials, all his uh, written manuscripts and uh, to save it uh, in a secret place. And that was in fact the beginning of the archive of the Alpatochka. Of course, then I had to keep it in a secret place until uh, the 1st of January 1990. And uh, at that time, as you know, I said, or you said, we uh, set up the official Alpatochka archive at the Center for Theoretical Study, uh, which we set up with Ivan in 1990. So that's the short story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, now, coming from a same pers or similar perspective, but uh, but uh, moving three decades later, it's quite sadly that uh, in some uh, environments and scenarios, the reality is not not much different. So, if 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 you always should uh, think about or describe what 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 how do you see the interaction with the diplomatic course in the world? What does it mean? How does it work? How does it not work? which I think would be very interesting. Thank you very much. First of all, some words about Belarus and Belarusian situation after the last presidential elections. So elections took place in a relatively uh, free and fair atmosphere, definitely comparatively to the situation which was in Belarus during the last 10 years. But immediately after elections, uh, more than 700 uh, people were arrested. It was a joke that some of police uh, leaders was fired because he had a <clears throat> command to collect at least 1,000 people to arrest, and he did, he failed with such uh, <clears throat> command. So at least 700 people were arrested, and it was a moment when uh, Lukashenko 
wanted uh, every, everyone to scare, everyone to afraid of of future and uh, to tell the truth, uh, during the first days uh, he succeeded a little. And uh, you should imagine if in Czech Republic, for example, 700 people would be arrested. So almost in every family was someone who was arrested, who was under uh, under, under uh, terror, under... Uh, so uh, in several weeks, majority of them were released because they were sentenced according to administ administrative code, but at least uh, 50 people uh, were arrested for criminal cases. And you should imagine that uh, families of those people were totally... Uh, so no one, as a matter of fact, was ready for such big scale of repressions. So I will I would tell it uh, a case of my family, where my wife, who was not participating actively in my election campaign, who is a just ordinary teacher of English in uh, one of state universities, uh, so she was totally, uh, so the situation for her was totally new. And definitely those days, uh, any support from friends, any support from uh, relatives was really of great importance, and definitely any support of foreign foreigners. Uh, elections were organized on 19th of December, so definitely majority of embassies were on location. I mean that it was Christmas time, and as a matter of fact, they came back only on 4th of January. So two weeks, at least two weeks, no one of, no, I would not say no one, but majority of employees of embassies were out of Minsk. Uh, all, of the, all, all of friends who was falling to my wife to, uh, to, to, to say some words in support immediately were calling to police and to KGB, if to KGB for conversation just by telephone. If they are falling to my wife in 15 minutes, uh, someone from KGB is phoning to them and uh, sending, the, uh, sending them official invitation for KGB for investigation for some conversation. So uh, KGB and uh, by the way, Belarus is the only country of the former Soviet Union where uh, Secret Services still has named KGB Committee of State Security. Uh, to my mind, it's just because they have no enough money and uh, influence, so they, they they would like to scare people with the same <laughs> name like in the old, old Soviet Union, but. Uh, so, uh, definitely in uh, uh, KGB failed, because so many people phoned to my wife that uh, they simply couldn't, didn't have enough people, enough employees to invite all others to KGB eh, for uh, hearings. So, uh, finally, uh, my wife got uh, support from friends. It was very well developed structures of human rights organization, by the way, uh, on Belarusian section, we will speak about it very much in the special Belarusian session. Uh, Alice Bilatsky, who leader of Spring 96 Human Rights Center, who organized support for advocates, for lawyers, who organized support for families, uh, for giving some uh, foods and clothes for political prisoners. So he now is in prison. He, and uh, everyone is asking why the leader of Human Rights Association, deputy chairman of International Federation of Human Rights, while he is in prison, just because he organized, or was one of those who organized and who helped uh, us to struggle, and because of him, I would say, Lukashenko failed with this atmosphere of total scare, of, to of total. Uh, because of him, people were not so afraid of like of uh, of being active. And my wife, she had she, she had a feeling of support from people, and definitely in such case, support from embassies, support from uh, diplomats was very much was very important. The diplomats were inviting her for dinners. They were coming to my home place. They were um, <coughs> making some presents for uh, for my younger daughters. And it was really very, very important. So such support of international community, uh, and first of all, support of international community, which is in Minsk, was very, very important. Uh, after I was released, uh, I should say that uh, in uh, prison, uh, three weeks, I was not speaking to an like, to investigator, and I, was, I refused to give any evidences. So they organized uh, like very big scale of terror, 
And finally, it was uh, torches. Uh, some strange people with black masks from presidential guard service appeared in our uh, detention center. So they were ready for everything. They pressed with all possible means. And uh, after torches, they, they need to speak to them. And final step was that uh, they broke me uh, and they told that the only variant for me to go out of the prison is to become a KGB agent. So uh, because I was one of the candidates who potentially could go out of prison because I was not a private enemy of Lukashenko, I decided to do it and immediately after I uh, was released, I, I, I organized a press conference. I proclaimed, I told about torches in the KGB detention center. I told about that uh, all of us were forced to become a KGB agents. Uh, to sign a special declaration of cooperation with KGB. And you should uh, imagine that, that this day when I organized such a press conference, when KGB and Lukashenko's forces were deciding what to do with me again, because I was in Belarus, I still was in Belarus, two weeks after my press conference, I was in Belarus. Uh, so this day, uh, I had a telephone call from Karl Schwarzenberg, Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs. You should uh, imagine how important such telephone call was because definitely our telephones were totally controlled by KGB. They were totally controlled by uh, authorities. It means that they knew that people are caring about, that foreign, for foreign countries are caring about us. They are thinking about us. Uh, my wife had a telephone call from a wife of Polish uh, President Bronislaw Komorowski. Uh, it was uh, the same day I was invited by Ambassador of Great Britain and Ambassador of uh, Germany. And I would say that it helped me, definitely I don't know how decisions, about decision making process within KGB and secret services, but two weeks after it I was, I was free. I mean, uh, I, was, I was not caged. Only in more than two weeks they took a decision to put me back to prison. And I'm absolutely sure that it's also because of a huge uh, international support and uh, direct international support because as I told they are caring about our telephone calls, they are hearing our telephone calls, they, they know what, what's going uh, on from our phones. And uh, just one more very important remark before I will finish with my speech. Uh, we are speaking about visiting uh, dissidents by foreign diplomats and politicians. I think, yes, definitely, it's, it's very, very impo important. Uh, one of, uh, at the moment, uh, those two candidates who are still in prison, uh, Andrei Sannikov and uh, Mikolai Statkevich, they are under huge and very, uh, really very huge pressure because Lukashenko, he knows that he will release them soon. Because of foreign pressure, because Lukashenko needs money for in order to survive, so it's, to my mind, it's just open trade uh, money for European Union proposed uh, some money for Lukashenko in exchange of releasing political prisoners. So Lukashenko is definitely very much interested in broken, broken those politicians who are still in prison, uh, broken the main candidate Andrei Sannikov and. I'm absolutely sure that they are doing everything possible and impossible in order to break them uh, morally and physically. Uh, and definitely now it's, it's time when all uh, demonstrations of support are really very, very much, uh, are really very, very important. And one of such uh, opportunities is come, the coming of some foreign politicians without any official invitation by a tourist visa where they, they, they can come to the country. Definitely they will not uh, give, Belarusian authorities will not give next visa to them, but at least one use of such uh, visits can be. So uh, it's uh, one of very important tools. Uh, and I just wanted to mention, uh, I know that some diplomats are functioning within international structures, so they are not so open to change the program which it was uh, coordinated or which was agreed with Belarusian authorities. So to my mind, one of such uh, very important demonstrations of support can be visiting of such places 
For example, near Minsk, close to Minsk city, very cool, extremely close to Minsk Circle Road, Circle Road. Uh, there is a place where in 1937 uh, more than 100 people were killed by Stalin uh, by Stalin's uh, service, secret services. Uh, and during communist times, no one from communists, no, no one from authorities were, was told that yes, this place exists. So this place was simply a forest with, uh, uh, without any special signs. And it was a huge uh, fighting between Belarusian civil society and authorities to commemorate such places, to put uh, their, uh, to put their, to tell and openly to demonstrate that yes, it's it's, it's place where uh, thousands and thousands of people were killed. So foreign diplomats, while visiting Belarus, if they are limited to visit uh, to visit some Belarusian, uh, some Belarusians. Uh, or dissidents or family members. I think family members of prisoners are very, very important. I think they must uh, try to agree with Belarusian authorities visiting of such places like this place where thousands of people were killed. Because uh, the fact that someone from, from, from the European Union, some of the diplomats visited such place will become itself uh, like public demonstration of caring about civil society of Belarus. Because you should remember that Lukashenko <coughs> is a member, former member of Communist Party. So he is one of those people who are still have uh, such post-communist tradition. Yeah. Uh, so visiting of such places is very, very important uh, declaration of support for civil society. Uh, if someone from from foreign diplomats will, be, will openly visit such places and definitely even without being accompanied by someone from Minister of Foreign Affairs of Belarus, it will be really very, very good declaration and demonstration that uh, West is a caring about Belarusian civil society, is caring about our history, caring about our traditions. So thank you very much. I will, after all panelists will uh, have right or will have opportunity to speak, uh, I will be ready to discuss and answer all questions. Thanks. Thank you very much for the interesting remarks. Uh, I think these are a number of topics that, that we'll get to later, actually. I think the one that uh, you, you mentioned a number of tools that the diplomatic core, the diplomats can actually do. And I think if they should have one common denominator, that apart from moral support, it's it's visibility, basically. And I, and I don't mean to overgeneralize that, but I think there's basically, in the, in the from what we can see from our NGO practice, and I think it's generally the rule, is that uh, uh, from the completely grassroots level where people operate even on, under the radar of their own authorities, then they start to grow and, and they, it, then it becomes actually dangerous. And then if attention from the Western or whatever diplomatic, diplomatic court can gain a level of visibility, it can then serve as a layer of protection, obviously. And the, 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 the most dangerous zone, uh, actually, I would argue, is somewhere in between for people who are actually already visible but not that may be in the, in the, among, the, among the people who already have that, have that attention. And uh, yes, so it, with that we, would, we, we heard a number of uh, views from the, let's say, the, the, the practicing dissident uh, activist part and we're moving to the, to the institutional part, which, is, uh, which are the diplomats. So I would like to pass the word to Mr. Timmermans to actually for his remarks, how this actually works, what are the tools and what, what is the strategy, strategy and what can be done. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to tell you that, that it's, it's important for me to be here at this place where this very important meeting was held in um, so many years ago in 1977. And um, I have to tell you that the biggest professional gift I was ever given was to be allowed to learn from Maximum Stuhl for so many years. And one of the biggest personal gifts I was ever given was his friendship. Uh, and I really miss him. He passed away in April, uh, and he leaves a big void. Um, he is, to many Dutch people, um, our conscience uh, in international affairs. And he's dearly missed. Um, now, to the subject matter. For him, this meeting afterwards was a very, very painful memory. Um, because um, 
<clears throat> it took some political courage for him to have that meeting, but his hesita hesitations were not linked to the question whether it was politically opportune to have this meeting. His hesitations were purely linked to the personal safety um, of uh, Mr. Patochka. And um, he then, of course, afterwards saw what happened to him. And there was always a, 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 a feeling of, of responsibility. I don't want to say guilt, but he felt responsible for this. And it really fed his anger. Um, and Max von Stuhl, until the very last days of his life, was always angry about injustice. And his, um, when he described Patochka to me and his, the value of, of, of young Patochka to him, uh, it was always in terms of his philosophy. He said, Patochka described Europe as an area of freedom and truth, uh, which was always in development, which was never finished, which always would need taking care of because there would always be risks of unfreedom, of, of, of uh, uh, repression, and untruths, of lies. And I think this is what driv Max von der Stuhl, and it is very important to just briefly put this in the context of the day. Because Charta 77, of course, uh, was unthinkable without the Helsinki Final Acts of 1975. And when these Final Acts were, were concluded, uh, Max von der Stuhl was Foreign Minister for the Netherlands, and he came under very fierce criticism in the Netherlands and elsewhere for these acts. Incidentally, the US Senate almost voted down um, the Helsinki Final Act because they thought it was not balanced enough. Um, the big prize in the Helsinki Final Act for the, for the Soviet bloc was the recognition of their statehood, um, of their borders and their statehood. That had never been done before, and that's the prize they were looking for. And they thought giving political and civil rights, individual rights, to their citizens was a small price for them to pay because their constitutions were of a declarity in nature, not normative. So they could, you know, write the most beautiful constitution in the world and it would not be applied. The only thing where they didn't, uh, and what they didn't anticipate, is that very brave people in, in some of the nations would claim these rights that were rightly theirs by this international treaty and that countries like them, Czechoslovakia needed to put this into law. So. You know, all of those who say that power ultimately only comes out of the uh, of guns are uh, proven wrong when you see what the effect was of the Helsinki Final Act and the human dimension of the CSE <coughs> and later OCE process. And Max von Sul strongly believed in this. Now, another thing you need to remember from the Dutch perspective at the time, he, he was a Labour foreign minister. Now, he was very strongly of the belief that something is true or not, something is just or not, regardless of the ism that acts. So he was an anti-fascist, but he was also an anti-communist, because he saw that both systems led to repression. And this was not very popular in, in left-wing Europe in the 1970s. You know, certain isms were not as bad as other isms. <coughs> um, and um, you, could get, you could get the left in Europe and Western Europe to rally against the dictatorship in Greece or in, in or in Chile or whatever, but you know they were very nuanced about the dictatorships in this part of the world, and this is something that is still weighing, I think, on the left's conscience until today. And incidentally, one of the painful memories I have as a member of the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly is that it was very easy in the Parliamentary Assembly to get a condemnation of, of Nazi and fascist uh, uh, crimes but almost impossible to get this, a likewise condemnation of communist crime. Very shameful thing for the left to still do these things. Some, some part of the left still does that. Anyway, he, did, he was colorblind in, term, in terms of injustice. If something was not just, um, he would fight it. Now, what was so important here is that he showed that the West was willing no longer to accept the premise that international relations were the sole remit of state-to-state -state negotiations. So the, the thing the dictatorships in Eastern Europe said, we exist, our people don't, in terms of international relations. That was the, you know, and, and, and the sole act of meeting someone of Qatar 77 was the declaration, you exist, you are people, you have rights, rights which belong to you personally. And I think that, that is the strength of these meetings then, and that will have to be the strength of these meetings today. Now, quickly moving to, to modern uh, diplomacy. 
I think things are more complicated now because of the huge power shifts uh, we see in the world. Now, let's, let's take the Dalai Lama uh, as an example, because that's a very, very powerful example. Um, the Netherlands in uh, 95, if I'm not mistaken, or 96, took the bold move in condemning um, China in the Human Rights uh, uh, Forum in, in, in the UN in Geneva. And then China immediately reacted uh, negatively to this, and you saw all the other EU states quickly retreating from the Netherlands and saying, whoa, bad, bad boys in the Hague, what you did, shouldn't have done that. And it had an immediate effect on the economic position of the Netherlands, and it favored the economic position of France and other nations. Now, what I'm trying to say is, I think these things are still very important. I think, I think receiving the Dalai Lama is important, not as a signal, but as a diplomatic tool. But it will only have effect. It will only have effect if you do it on a bigger scale. Economies of scale have worked out in foreign policy. Europe has only, and I, I, I hope I can make myself heard at the presidential palace on this point, Europe will only have an effect on world events if Europeans speak with one voice, especially in human rights, because the people you're speaking to have become so big and so powerful, they will not, no longer listen to individual nations, but they will have to listen to what is to them also the most important market in the world. So I think this is a very strong need to have a European Union human rights policy and to be bolder in that human rights policy, to address such things as are happening in China, etc. To also take into account local conditions, to look at what works best in those conditions. Von der Stuhl always did that, and this is what I really learned from him. Now finally, just one, one brief uh, remark, because I think um, there is so much work to do here. There is no room for cynicism. We should fight cynicism within ourselves and in the discussions in Brussels. This dictatorship in this country, to everyone from the outside, was set in stone. People like Patochka, Havel, and all the others were just seen as dreamers. As dreamers. And this is what's still happening today in the world, because a dictatorship always looks like it's set in stone, right until the day it crumbles. And that should keep us going in addressing injustices all over the world, albeit to justify Max von der Stuhl's memory. Thank you. Thank you very much for the brief remarks. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Galushka, you can. I, I have to say that as a not only as a person working for a Czech NGO, but as a citizen, I'm, I'm very glad that, that the Czech Republic, my country, tends to be among those who are, who are very vocal about, about the human rights and democracy on the international stage. So uh, we'd be very happy to hear your perspective as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a great honor for me to participate in this panel alongside such distinguished colleagues and to pay tribute uh, to the memory of Max Butler's tool. Uh, <coughs> It is difficult to take the floor up to such an eloquent speaker, so with your kind permission, I will read my prepared statement. And later on, of course, I'm ready to uh, elaborate on any issues that you might raise. Uh, to meet with dissidents and oppressed opposition leaders in totalitarian countries during official visits was not common back in 1977. Max van der Stoel created a precedent which has been followed by democratic politicians until today. By following this precedent, democratic politicians not only show respect and render moral support to great dissidents and freedom fighters, they can also strengthen their position vis-a-vis -vis the repressive regime by showing interest of the outer world in their deeds and their faith. Last but not least, meeting between politicians from democratic countries and dissidents from non-democratic ones sends a clear message to public on both sides, as well as to authoritarian politicians. Human rights are universal and inalienable and have to be respected. Uh, today, the Czech Republic, along with the Netherlands and of course other countries, is a part of the democratic world. Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs, <coughs> Mr. Carlos Schwarzenberg, who was unfortunately not able to uh, take part in this discussion, uh, is in Luxembourg today. Uh, indeed, 
himself a well-known supporter of human rights and democracy already in 1977. Also, his chairmanship of the International Helsinki Committee for the Human Rights between 1984 and 1989 made him contribute to the improvement of human rights situation in Central and Eastern European countries, including the Czech Republic. Still, he personally remains committed to these values. He, along with other Czech foreign policymakers, firmly believes that meeting dissidents and members of opposition, either on the occasion of an official visit or when they themselves travel around Europe, can be an effective tool of support to democratic changes and developments in the oppressive regimes. Czech foreign policy has been using this tool and will continue to do so mainly, but not exclusively, of course, in countries like Cuba, Burma, or Belarus. Yet, we must keep in mind that a meeting between a politician on an official visit and a local dissident is a meeting of two completely different worlds. After the meeting, the politician boards a plane and soon arrives in his safe and cozy home, while the dissident remains exposed to the oppressive regime. Sometimes, after a meeting with an important figure from the democratic world, the pressure of the regime on a dissident can even increase. Therefore, a democratic politician who, following the example of Mr. Funder, Max van der Stoel, meets a dissident in a non-democratic country is also taking partial responsibility for what happens with him after the meeting. He and his country must remain <coughs> committed to the support and protection of that person by all possible means and over the long run. Let me conclude by expressing admiration and gratitude to Max van der Stoel for leaving us a respected heritage and a new tool of democracy support. A delicate tool, though, which we should use wisely and sensibly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think before you open the floor to discussions, we have a number of uh, perspectives. Excuse me, please, yes. Uh, I'm invited to the other meeting, yes, I think it's from 4 o'clock. Excuse me, please. I think that he is so plenty, very well informed people. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We heard a number of uh, number of uh, very, very interesting statements and, and accounts that, that overlap on, on many layers. Uh, it was mentioned by both Mr. Timmermans and Mr. Galushka the issue of responsibility for the people afterwards. Actually, it's not it's possible to draw a line between the meeting uh, that the Patachka had, had with on this tool and, and his death actually, which which is something that of course was not must not planned, but it, it's something that that was. Uh, there was a certain correlation, of, and of course, this uh, this uh, issue of, of to what degree the, the assistance and the attention is, is actually helping, and to what it can endanger the person. It's it, it's a very heavy burden on, on the. I would for, from from the experience from the NGO, I would argue that the that the benefits are are usually larger, and I have so seldom I don't know about your experience, but seldom but, but almost never seen a dissident. Actively regretting the, the, the contact, or, or, or if there is such a case, then, then of course it has to be uh, you know, followed and obliged by the by the by the external forces. But but at least from from the uh, experience that our organization, for example, has in places like Belarus and Barna, Cuba, and so on, it's it's uh, very usually uh, welcome. Also, uh, there was the question uh, we, we heard about the number of tools that that are being used to whether our politicians visiting the residents or official visits or traveling unofficially at least for once before they get uh, kicked out of the country uh, invite them to, to to events at the embassies and, and the various others other points and if I just one question before you open to the public for, for the, the let's say the political part of our panel would be the question of, uh, of the of the political will and the, the, the necessity of the, the political coherence and actually how this should be done on the level of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You mentioned that, that there is indeed a need for, for a coherent and, and bold human rights policy within the EU. That of course is an interaction of 27 bodies that it's, it's a 
very valid and very important goal, but not, not one that can, one can see in the immediate horizon. You also mentioned that indeed in some cases, as, as with the condemnation of China in the 90s, there indeed were real economic impacts of the decision. So if we stay on the state level, not the, the EU level, uh, where it is, what, what kind of, uh, at what, uh, do you think the political law has to be clearly there from the, on behalf of the ministry, kind of uh, instructing the diplomats what they have to do, or is it something to be played more carefully, uh, less uh, openly? Well, you know, t two remarks about this. First of all, I think, of course, the states remain the most important actors, but if you want to be effective as a state in this area, make sure you have somebody backing you. Make sure you don't get other states to do something contrary, because then everybody loses. Um, so, if you want to act, uh, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis another country, discuss it before then, discuss it in Brussels, and make sure people don't stab you in the back. Just get the guarantee, and especially also with the Americans, so that you're on the same page. This is extremely important. This is what von Stuhl did in the OEC. He never attacked a nation or a group without being absolutely sure that he had convinced the major parties to support him. With because if they drop you once, then you know your role is, is, is almost certainly finished. Secondly, you need to get into the heads of all diplomats, everyone, that this is not an easy issue. It is not something you like to do, to confront your partners with, with something that is uncomfortable. It is not something I like to do when I travel abroad, to be very blunt about human rights when I meet a, a minister or somebody else from another nation. It is, so you have to get your young diplomats and older diplomats you get them used to the fact that sometimes, you know, the message you have to bring is not a nice one, and the reaction will not be nice either, but this is something that sometimes needs to be done. And I think that if you are fair in how you say it, it you know, you have to be careful in, in, you have to choose the right instrument, because sometimes you can be far more effective in not going public, but in being very direct and firm in private meetings. Um, that sometimes, you know, especially in the Asian world, if you prevent people from losing face publicly, you can get more done sometimes than what you would do, you'd be able to do uh, by only going public. But this is, I mean, this is, these are the, this, this is the trade, this is our job, this is our profession. And you need to be professional enough to choose the right instrument at the right time with the right uh, uh, situation. Thank you. Do you have any perspective on that? I don't fully subscribe to what Minister Timmerman said. Uh, of course, uh, every policy needs some guidance, and uh, I must say that uh, in the Czech foreign policy, defense of human rights is a major uh, topic, and uh, it's included in the government declaration, it's, it's included in all our priorities. So we don't have to urge our diplomats to cooperate, if you uh, as indicated, uh, that uh, they need to work on orders. Or, of course, the personal example of Minister Schwarzenberg and President Allard gives us uh, a general guidance and, and a good, good example in this regard. But as uh, Mr. Timmermans noted, uh, sometimes uh, it's more effective not to go public with things, you have to be uh, careful, you have to pay the price. For instance, for our diplomats in Cuba, the price of meeting uh, the, the opposition leaders means that they don't have any contact with official authorities at all. Our charge up there in Havana uh, was not accepted in the foreign ministry. We waited for long months to uh, when he asked for a meeting and sometimes he, he was never uh, never allowed to meet with higher officials as well there are there may be an even economic price and there every government has a constituency there's there's a parliament there are uh, companies entrepreneurs who constantly lobby against any disruption of good relations with uh, Economically strong countries, or they don't even have to be economically strong. It would well be Belarus, with, with which we enjoyed historical economic uh, contacts, and now many uh, companies want to renew them. And of course, every uh, 
problem that comes from an official level reflects into their business interests. So, so that's another issue. Also, we know, I think, uh, concretely in Belarus, uh, some support can be misused by the government to accuse the persons of criminal activity. I like noted uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, was it Mr. Stankovic who got accused of uh, receiving funds from abroad and not uh, duly uh, taxing them or, or uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. so so it's it's uh, it's another thing that one has to be very uh, cautious about. But I agree fully with the chairman that uh, uh, in most cases the advantages prevail over uh, the dangers and that we should um, continue this policy. Thank you very much. So, yeah, if you have a question, please, uh, we have microphones here. You can try it without them, but if the room is not the response, we have to. So, is there a question at this point? Or maybe use the microphone group, but I think it would be easier for everyone. I thank you very much for your very courageous work and the remarks today. And my uh, question, I'm Kathleen Kibani, I'm a researcher and a professor from Canada. And I'm interested in the two points um, Minister Timmermans remark about uh, dissuading cynicism and how we go about that, but also the act of courage which everyone is demonstrating, and uh, your remarks particularly spoke to that in the end, of the importance of recognizing that. So if you could speak more to the role to dissuade cynicism and efforts to encourage greater uh, widespread courage in times of difficulty. Um, you know, one of the biggest sources of cynicism vis-a-vis -vis the West human rights policy is our past behavior the last 10 years. As a result of 9-11, of, of we've sort of set different standards for ourselves than what we've asked of other people. Uh, and of course, you're, you're, you will always be confronted when, you know, whenever you, you speak to, to another nation where there's a human rights problem, yeah, yeah, but what about Guantanamo Bay? I mean, that, that has happened to me so many times. But not just the other nation. What has really struck me as, as an elected politician in the last years is that the cynicism has also gotten into Dutch society and, and European society. You talk about human rights when it's far off, but you don't talk about human rights when things don't go wrong and when things go wrong in the Western world. And and so if you want to combat cynicism, you have to practice what you preach. If we don't start practicing what we preach again, to the full extent, then of course we will have no right to speak to others about what they're doing wrong. So cynicism is very much linked with double standards. And of course, countries like Iran, who, who, who shouldn't be even you know, trying to argue these points, will argue them. And if you, you, know, if you, if you, if you provide your enemies with the timber for your own uh, uh, bonfire, then of course it's your own fault. And I think there's, there's a, we, need, we need to re-examine, um, you know, 10 years after 9-11, where we went wrong as far as uh, addressing our own human rights problems. Let me just react to it really quickly. That, that typically for me, in that kind of argument and all the double standards, which I would very agree that it's a real issue, but I used one counter-argument that, that does not explain it fully, but still, usually talking about public, not, not, Policy. Where have you learned about human rights abuses in the of countries? Typically in the media of the free world. Where have you learned about the abuses of human rights in the free world? Like Montana, all the others. Again, the, the same media of the free world. So it, this is just the point to illustrate that usually, uh, as, as, as big and serious as this issue is, you, the, in, in the free world at least there are some sort of self-cleaning mechanisms that hopefully can you know, uh, make things better. You know. This is not to diminish the issue of double standards, but just that it's not completely the same as, as the arguments of the put. Any other reaction? I think, you know, partly, 
cynicism also comes from the fact that this is a never-ending fight. There will never be a solution uh, worldwide uh, for uh, human rights abuses, and, 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 and this is uh, something that may uh, make some people uh, uh, giving hopes that, that, that uh, this is a worthwhile uh, battle or worth, worthwhile fight. But another thing which adds to the cynicism is, is, is the media. They're reporting about the international organizations, for instance, the fact that on the Council on Human Rights there could sit countries that certainly uh, do not adhere uh, to uh, or do not have respect for the human rights. Like Cuba has been sitting on the Council of the whole time since it has been established and, and is very vocal in, uh, by the way, of course, uh, pointing to the double standards which we sometimes uh, create or, or we have to face. And uh, same uh, for, for other organizations. So since this world is so globalized and everything is so visible, uh, people tend to be disappointed by, by the results and that they had to the cynicism. Is there another question? Please. I'm Miguel Nix, a journalist of the Netherlands. I would like to ask uh, a question to the, the Czechian uh, people. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is. Uh, Shklova is not there anymore, but we'll talk to her tomorrow. Okay. Um, and it's about this. We are, of course, it's, I'm very glad Mr. Mikhailovich is, is here. We are also talking about uh, the, the heritage of, of Kharta and what it, and the way diplomats and journalists uh, uh, deal with such uh, dissident groups. And, um, but my question is about uh, a Czechian, uh, nowadays Czechian in this uh, vision. Um, how do you think this heritage of Gata is this uh, idealistic democratic feeling, etc., etc., et et uh, uh, the rule of law, uh, is in uh, your own country now uh, still living? Is it, is it somewhere? And um, I re read, I read lots of commands, commands of um, your uh, president, Mr. Klaus, and sometimes I think it's very, very far away. This heritage. Thank you. Do I do that? Okay, so first civil society, then. <laughs> <laughs> Of the, of the Charter 77, if you can feel it these days, still in the society, or what, uh, if the legacy is somehow present in, in the in the ethos of, of the society, or if, it, if it's gone, uh, would, would the point to uh, some comments from, from the current president, Mr. Klaus, that seem to be relatively far away from, from what the Charter represented? Well, uh, it's uh, in fact a very tricky question. Uh, I'm afraid that the, the direct legacy is not very much uh, uh, understood or remembered in the, in the majority of the population because it was in fact uh, uh, a group of people who in a way understood what is happening in, uh, in history or how to call it. And uh, the other people just were not uh, happy enough, uh, but uh, didn't understand what, what's the problem. And uh, now it is uh, some 20 years or more uh, 
after the basic change in 89. And uh, I feel that the most of the political power is uh, in the hands of people who, who in, in a way, have not contact with these, uh, with these uh, original powers which, uh, which uh, contributed to, to the change. And that the policy or politics in, in this country is uh, from the most part quite cynical to, to use the word which was already quoted. So I am quite, uh, quite uh, pessimistic about, uh, about the situation. The, the trouble is that uh, we are in a way free country and uh, the freedom is quite, quite uh, obvious. And uh, that is perhaps something which uh, makes it uh, possible that this uh, legacy of uh, struggle is in a very well, fading. Okay, so this was a, a rather grim view of civil society as for the government perspective. So, you know, this is how I would agree with Mr. Kwaki, uh, that uh, the perception of the memories of uh, Charter 77 are not uh, alive or common uh, among, especially young people, you have to realize it is really a distant history. You know, it's been uh, 34 years. Uh, and if you mention yourself being 20 and uh, try to imagine what, uh, what was 34 years before that, you know, if I remember when we were uh, living through 1968 and Soviet invasion, you know, for us, uh, <coughs> the history of the years before that was something irrelevant. So this is one uh, element that does not really uh, somehow wish uh, well to the you know, memory and perception of, of this important historical act. but. Of course, among politicians, intellectuals, uh, historians, and others, this is still a, a very important turning point in, in the modern history of Czechoslovakia. So uh, I think we, uh, we're all aware of what, uh, in, of what it really meant uh, for all of us. But in the general public, if you ask, I have two remarks uh, on, on this issue. My first remark would be, my oldest kids are 24 and 22. They travel to parts of Europe where I couldn't go before. And they think this is the natural state of things. Um, you see people uh, uh, from Prague and other places in the Czech Republic every weekend in Amsterdam and having a good time. Uh, perhaps a too good time, but never mind. And they travel there without passports. Um, they travel anywhere in Europe. We have created a habitat for our youngest generation, which is Europe-wide. This is the biggest gift Carter 77 gave to Europe. And this is an undying legacy, because for the, these young people, this is something they will see as a normal state. And they will work and think uh, and live according to that state. And that, I think that is a huge, huge gift. And my second remark would be, people, this is never finished. This is never, ever finished. And regression is also possible. In our countries, in this country, in my country, human rights could be worse tomorrow than they are today. This is one of the legacies of Jan Patoschka, where he said Europe will need to be worked at eternally, because it's never finished. And rights are never set in stone or guaranteed. It can always be. What is made by man can also be disrupted by man. And that is the second part of my remark, that we will need to work at this and stay at this, because it will never be finished. Okay, another question. So, please. Uh, Michel Renan, the Netherlands Czech Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I have a question for two gentlemen on the official side. 
can we expect uh, quite soon a coordinated uh, action of the European Union uh, versus uh, China? Uh, you also both said that it works uh, better in Asiatic countries uh, not to do it in the open. I have till now uh, missed uh, a real uh, stance on human rights from the West Europe, uh, from the European Union side, and from most countries in the European Union uh, towards China, which undoubtedly uh, is uh, breaching human rights. Can we expect uh, such a coordinated action of the European Union living, let's say, five or ten years? Well, um, you know, the, when the Chinese Prime Minister was asked at some stage, um, uh, what do you think of the effects of the French Revolution? Uh, his reaction was, this was too naive, his reaction was, too early to tell. Um, so, the Chinese <laughs> take a very long-term perspective on things. Um, uh, and and um, I think, likewise, the Europeans and Americans should take a long-term perspective on things. Many things are very bad in China. Some things are moving towards a better situation. In some areas, they do seek a dialogue if you allow them to save face. But too limited areas. Um, and the problem for Europe is that Economic interest is so great that one country is always paid off against the other in Europe. And un unless Europe develops a common foreign and security policy that would have a one China policy in the sense that Europe would say the same thing, all countries about China, until we're not there, I think that, that will not fail. And, and as you know, if you're in business, the pressure business exerts on us not to be too vocal on China is huge. And this is directly linked to jobs. Uh, and no politician will go to elections having been very critical of human rights in China and then, as a net effect, having lost uh, thousands of jobs elsewhere in, in their own constituency. So only one European voice can have a real effect on these developments. Now, having said that, dictatorships always crumble, not because of in, uh, international pressure, but of internal shortcomings. Um, and international pressure can help enhance eternal shortcomings. Um, and that is what is ailing China, is that they cannot maintain the situation as it is today if they continue on the same footing. And that is what happened here in 77, that is what happened uh, in the Soviet Union in the late 80s, early 90s. It is always the internal collapse of a, of a rotten system that leads to real change. So, so we need to work towards that. Or we need to help the Chinese develop instruments that are more uh, in line with the rule of law and, and democracy. And in some areas it's working, in other areas it isn't. Uh, you know, we talked about the issue of Tibet. It's still a noble area for the Chinese, and we need to work at it that this becomes something we can debate, also internationally. I absolutely agree, and uh, there is no <coughs> common European policy towards China. Uh, let's hope that the establishment of the European uh, external action service under maybe action will slowly, gradually make some difference and we will work towards common positions and expressing them as well because it's one thing to have a position and the other to let's say uh, face to face to the Chinese president what, uh, what it is. So uh, we will, uh, I do have some hopes that uh, this uh, new element under the Lisbon Treaty, the establishment of the uh, European Examination Service may help. And not just towards China, but in other respects in the common foreign and security policy as well. Okay. I also add, you know, what I have to do with, compared to the gentleman on this panel on, on the issue, and also it's a very crude guess, but I would say that the internal situation of China also looks very differently from their point of view than from the, yes. from the external. It's much, it, it seems to be much more fragile, actually, internally than, than what is viewed from the outside. So my crude, uneducated guess would be that in 10 years the perspective would be different and different in a way that we might not expect now. Do you have a question?
I think afterwards we will have time for maybe one more question. So, is there anyone wanting to have one last question afterwards? I can think about it at the time. Um, my name is Barbara Dunn. And I am a liaison person for FOFI, which is Friends of a Free Iran. Um, this organisation is, is very much in its early stage in Czech Republic and is associated with the National Resistance Council of Iran, which I make some assumption that Mr. Tillmans is familiar with. And I'm not sure about Mr. Gomeshka, if you are familiar with the National Council of Resistance of Iran. But for people in the room who are not familiar with this organisation, they are the largest opposition group to the Iranian uh, regime. And the problem I face with acting on behalf of the people in Iran who are oppressed, tortured, executed daily, is that something you mentioned, Mr. Tillman, in relation to America, who at the moment regard this institution as a terrorist, have, has that this organisation which has been uh, supported by the European Union, has the support of more than 4,000 parliamentarians around the world, is still regarded by America and is listed as a terrorist institution. Um, it's the largest dissident group against the Iranian regime. And you mentioned the need for tact and public negotiation. How do you deal with it when you said you have to get the major bodies on side before you then attack uh, the regime itself? I'd appreciate your comments on that, and any advice. Well, frankly, to, to, to give you a very blunt, blunt answer, um, uh, I have my hesitations as far as the Mujahideen Khalq is concerned. Um, uh, given their past, um, given the situation now also, a deplorable situation in parts of Iraq where they are, pers uh, pers uh, where they are uh, hunted down and, and live in terrible situation, um, and, and the international community should put more pressure on the Iraqis to make sure that people are no longer murdered in Camp Ashraf and other places. But I don't really see um, um, a future for Iran with Mujahideen Khalq being in charge on their own. I think there is still need to broaden the platform uh, for cooperation of opposition parties in, in, in Iran. Um, um, ha having said that, I think everything, anything we can do to weaken the regime that is now in Tehran should be supported. Um, and I think that um, um, the Americans um, have painted themselves in a corner by not even looking for contacts. Um, they, they have very few contacts in Iran, uh, also with the opposition, to try and, and, and bring about some change. Now this regime still um, has a very uh, able uh, way of uh, accommodating the poorer parts of the population by giving them cheap bread and cheap fuel. Um, and that guarantees them a measure of support that keeps them in, in power. Now this will not be sustainable, and they know it's not sustainable, that's why they're, they're arming themselves at such a horrible rate. Um, so I think, um, I think the, the European Union is divided on the issue, it's not, it's not um, unisono. Some countries are more on the American line and other countries are more lenient towards the regime, especially if they have huge business interests, such as the Germans. Um, um, so I wouldn't see that as an example of, of effective EU policy, frankly. Uh, but I think there should be more dialogue between the EU and the United States to develop a strategy towards Iran that works, that prevents them from developing nuclear weapons. They're on the way of developing nuclear weapons, and it's only a matter of time that Israel will lash out at them, because Israel will then be fighting for its survival. So this. Iran is a major, major security problem in uh, the area. Um, it is a, a repressive regime uh, that has a horrible effect on the Iranian population. It's killing its youngest generation, uh, people especially in Tehran, with so much talent, so much openness towards the world, were not allowed to use that, that potential. 
So we really, really need a, a joint initiative by the EU and the Americans. Um, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. So uh, my upshot is that I'm rather pessimistic about how we're going to, to tackle that issue in the, in the, in the, in the short run. Um, but if we don't, um, it will escalate sooner or later. There will be violence if we don't make sure that we have another way of dealing with the issue. <coughs> I think uh, our time is more or less up. I know I promised one more question, but I also promised to the organizers that we will end up on time. So, thank you very much for, for coming here. Thanks to the distinguished panelists to, to be here with us. And I hope you will enjoy the rest of the, of the conference. Um, we heard a number of, number of views, very, very interesting thoughts. I think that uh, you can also say that the dictatorships and authoritative regimes are in a way dysfunctional bodies that want to be unsustainable. And in that regard, I would like to end with a quote I, I really liked uh, from the yesterday's keynote by Joseph Stiglitz, although he used it in a different meaning. He said, that what is unsustainable won't be sustained. <laughs> so uh, with that wish, I think we can, we can end the panel. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest. <laughs>